So um, what I'm going to talk about today is the way that we can use paleontology resources to understand um, species distributions and think about how to uh, deal with human-caused environmental change and the effects that it has on uh, species distributions, okay? And so when we think about human effects on ecosystems today, there's two main areas um, of concern. One is habitat fragmentation. I've got this happy farmer to represent habitat fragmentation. As we take uh, wild habitats and we slice and dice them to make space for cultivation and food production for humans or other resource use, we might leave wild spaces, but they're cut up and not connected anymore. Um, and then there's also overall climate change. So we are pretty familiar with this idea that as we release carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, we're changing the global climate state, increasing the average temperature of the earth, and locally the temperature might be going up or down depending on the nuances of the climate system. Okay, and you don't just have to take my word for it. There's actually a lot of research that shows the effects of both habitat fragmentation and climate change on ecosystem health and uh, even evolution. So this study by Haddad et al. from 2015 is a meta-analysis of a bunch of different studies that looked at the effects of different kinds of habitat fragmentation, um, reducing the area of habitats, um, breaking up habitats into new isolated fragments, or modifying habitats so that the edge is increased and there's less sort of secret space in the middle. If you think about the habitat fragment, the organisms that are living in the middle of it are going to be less disturbed than the ones that are around the edge. And so if you modify the shapes of your habitat fragments so that there's more edge and less middle, and then you end up with less um, available safe space for the animals and plants and fungi and microbes in the middle of your habitat fragments. And what they found in all of these different cases is that they had a negative effect on biodiversity in those ecosystems. And the effect is up to negative 75%, so losing three quarters of the biodiversity in an ecosystem um, when it was modified in certain ways. And, uh, and, and whether or not you had large or small changes to the count of species, you had impairment of key ecosystem functions when you had fragmented habitats. Okay. Um, another study I found that was really interesting showed that the effects of habitat fragmentation vary depending on how much natural disturbance there was in the ecosystem. So if you're in an ecosystem that's more temperate and has um, natural regular disturbances, like a lot of places that have these sort of standard blazing fires naturally, um, those places tended to be less affected by habitat fragmentation because those ecosystems were already evolved to deal with natural fragmentation of the habitats and recovery from those kinds of disruptions. So in the end, when we think about habitat fragmentation as a problem, we should be focusing on areas like tropical rainforests that don't naturally have those kinds of um, uh, disruptions and so the ecosystems there are not pre-adapted to dealing with uh, fragmentation and uh, healing of habitats. And then we also have a lot of research that shows that there are major effects of climate change on biodiversity. Um, this review from 2019 by Nunez et al. Uh, is a really good summary of kind of what's going on. And what they show is that as global temperature increases, so this is bins of different potential global temperature increases. And then these are measurements of how much geographic area species maintain from their old ranges under different models of future warming. And what you can see is that as the temperature increases, species have less and less of their original range, which means that they'll either have to naturally migrate, so have spaces, corridors open so that they can move on their own, or in some cases, the loss of uh, range is so dramatic and so quick that we may have to actually, as ecologists, as conservation biologists, pick up individuals and these species and move them to new suitable habitat because they can't naturally move fast enough. 
Um, and that study showed that when the global climate change is above two degrees C, the change has an inflection point and becomes much more extensive. And so that's another piece of evidence that we should try to maintain our global climate change to less than two degrees uh, Celsius. Okay, so given all this context of known effect humans on uh, environments and species richness and ecosystem function, um, I'm going to propose that we can uh, use a paleontology perspective to understand these ecosystems and um, make choices to help uh, conserve different aspects of ecosystem function or biodiversity, depending on what we want to do. So I'm not the only one saying this. I'm actually like the 15th author on this paper from 2017, um, where all, all of us are paleontologists or modern conservation biologists who are putting together a, a sort of a system for trying to decide how to uh, make decisions for conservation biology and how to use paleontology resources in making those decisions. Okay, so this is just the first page of the paper, and this is a real critical figure from the paper that uh, shows the flowchart of how they go through and figure out an appropriate approach to conservation uh, methods. I'm going to break it down a little bit. Um, you start out with an ecosystem that you are trying to understand and conserve, and that might be a historical ecosystem, so one that is still functioning relatively like it has from times before human disturbance. Um, it may be disrupted, but it still has most of the pieces in place. Or it might be a novel ecosystem where there's been enough disruption that the ecosystem has reassembled into um, a configuration that we don't have any historical data to reference. Okay, and that's starting to happen more and more, and we expect that to happen uh, more and more, maybe even in an ex um, exponential rate as uh, climate change moves us into climate space that we haven't experienced uh, on Earth since before human history began, okay? And so one option is to try to just restore that novel ecosystem into a historical ecosystem, but I don't think that's actually a viable path for most of what we're doing now. So we understand that the environment's gonna continue to change. And even if we were at this moment just to stop all greenhouse gas production, uh, we'd still have a century or more of climate warming that's just left over from the um, sort of environmental momentum that we have right now. So, um, so when we're looking at model ecosystems, we should be thinking about them in terms of making them function in the space where they are and not trying to drag them back into a space that, that may just not exist anymore in terms of climate. Um, but if you do have a historical system, then you can measure its function and its similarity to a pre-human intervention ecosystem using taxon-based measures. So thinking about what species are actually in the ecosystem, looking at who's there, looking at relative abundance, and that's one that's often um, under-examined, but really important, um, because you can have a situation where the same species are in an ecosystem but their relative abundance has changed dramatically and so the ecosystem is no longer functioning properly. Um, thinking about genetic diversity and then millennium scale baseline. So looking back into the fossil record to try to understand uh, over the last thousand and two thousand years, what kinds of relative abundances, what kinds of species presence you had in that ecosystem. But you can also use these taxon free measures. Now, when you're dealing with a novel ecosystem, you don't have that millennium scale baseline to come back to. So you have to think in terms of measurements that tell you about health of this ecosystem. And those are not going to refer to specific taxa because you don't know which species need to be in the ecosystem. You just know that you need an ecosystem that operates in a sustainable, healthy way. And so you can look at things like biomass maintenance. You can look at the spread of the biomass over the different species, which is equivalent to the relative abundance. You can look at the diversity um, and think about the trophic structure. So do you have a complex food web with a lot of linkages that could be robust to perturbations, or do you have a relatively simple food web that could be disrupted by the loss of just a small number of species? Um, 
you can look at the functional traits. So looking at the shapes of the organisms and what shapes are represented without reference to which particular species. Do you have animals that are bottom feeding? Do you have animals that are feeding at the surface? Do you have animals that are feeding at the uh, water's edge? Thinking about the structures that they use in those contexts. Um, and you can also look at um, gene flow and thinking about how that's affecting the genetic diversity of your ecosystem. Okay. Now, going down, right? So we're taking this down the figure. Let me hide this little bar at the top. It's this one, right? Yes. Okay. So um, when you're dealing with a historical ecosystem that has some kind of a model you can look at either in the historical record or in the prehistoric fossil record, then you can have, uh, you can think about its vulnerability to global change in terms of those metrics we looked at before. And then if it's got a low vulnerability to global change, you might try to maintain that ecosystem in the situation that it has had over time. If it looks like it's in a stable place environmentally, climate models show that that place is going to be similar in its climate, even with global warming, and there are places on Earth that are like that, then you can do some work to keep that ecosystem stable in the same place it is. As, and uh, we have an example talking about Yellowstone, where they're doing this in the United States. Um, if it looks like that place is going to have a lot of global change effects, um, then you might think seriously about um, adaptive capacity. And instead of trying to keep it stable, thinking about managing it in such a way that um, things can move in and things can move out so that the system can naturally assemble into whatever kind of ecosystem would be appropriate for the new environment that's going to be in that spot. Um, and on this side, when you're dealing with an ecosystem that's already a novel ecosystem, so that's already happened, then you have basically three choices, three areas that you can emphasize. Um, one of them is maximizing biodiversity. So this is that old idea of just trying to keep as many pieces to the machine as possible. So you might be focusing on, like we do with tigers, conservation genetics, just to make sure that we're maintaining as high a genetic diversity within that species as possible. Or you might be thinking about connectivity between different uh, habitat patches so that species can move around and you can make sure that there is a habitat that each species can thrive in. Um, you might be dealing with invasive species, and instead of regarding them as a problem, thinking about them as potential components of these novel ecosystems and making sure that they don't overwhelm ecosystems, but instead fit in and work in a healthy ecological context. You can also focus on trying to mimic ecosystem structure and function. So instead of thinking about the number of species, you think about the way that pieces fit together. And so you're trying to focus on creating an opportunity for a healthy ecosystem to thrive in this new environment. And this is where rewilding as a concept kind of fits in, where we might be bringing animals in from other places where they're not gonna be able to survive in those changing environments, but we can put them into this new ecosystem in a way that will give them an opportunity to uh, thrive and hopefully be honed by natural selection over uh, time to create a healthy ecosystem that, that has long-term stability. Um, and then you can think about maximizing ecosystem services. And that's not something that a lot of uh, conservation biologists are too happy about, but we have to remember that um, we have to remember that ecosystems actually provide a lot of important services for maintaining healthy human communities too. And it may be that an ecosystem that's managed to maximize biodiversity doesn't give us the best opportunities for agricultural production, doesn't give us the best opportunities for protecting coastal communities from disruptive um, storm events, right? So it might be that the focus has to be on ecosystem services in terms of maintaining human health and then balancing that with maintaining some aspects of ecosystem health. Um, there's a lot of research, very interesting research on 
ways to interleave agricultural land with wild land so that um, you're maintaining space for organisms to live a wild existence, but also keeping space available for producing food for human consumption. Um, and I think that's going to actually have to be an important part of the way that we think about cropland in the future is thinking about cropland serving two purposes. One is producing food for humans, but also doing some work to help maintain ecosystem services in those areas. Um, and of course, this is where ecotourism falls in, because sometimes the way that you can maintain an ecosystem is getting people to pay money to come and look at it and experience it. OK, so that's sort of the overall context for um, for understanding how to use paleontology to look at um, ecosystem function. And what I'm going to do now is run through a series of studies that other people have done and that I've done um, that try to use fossils in a very practical way to understand how we can think about species moving their geographic ranges with climate change, okay? And this is probably review for most of the folks who are here, but I've been talking a lot about ecological niche modeling. And so the way that works is that you take a current species range. This is a species of Microtus. I think it's Microtus californicus. And then you map that species range onto climate variables like precipitation and temperature and extract the values that the organism experiences within its range to create a um, realized mid space in a climate space. Okay, so we're looking at different climate axes and where the species lives in that climate space. And then you can use that realized mid space um, placed onto paleoclimate reconstructions or projections of future climate to come up with potential new distributions for that species in the altered environment, okay? And so there's a lot of research that uses this approach to project species distributions into the future. When we say, here is a 2100 climate surface that we project using climate models, where would we expect these species to live? But it's also possible to take that same approach and project it backwards to the last glacial maximum. And so a lot of research has focused on this time period because it is, um, you know, it's only about 20,000 years ago. So there's a huge fossil record of organisms that lived in that time. It's very well represented. So the sample sizes are pretty big. And it's recent enough that we can do a good job of modeling what the climate was like at that time and being fairly confident that we have a good picture of that uh, paleoclimate surface. And so um, one of the first studies to take this approach of looking at how uh, niche modeling would project back onto the last glacial maximum was this study by Martinez Meyer et al. in uh, 2004. And they looked at about uh, 20 species of fossil mammals. And they took an approach of um, building a niche model using the Pleistocene distribution and projecting it forward to today and seeing how well that fit, but then also taking a niche model built on the present distribution and projecting that backward to the Pleistocene to see how well that fit. And, um, and what they discovered was, this is their result set. Um, this axis is the present predicting the Pleistocene and they've got percent correctly predicted. And then this axis is the Pleistocene predicting the present and percent correctly predicted. And um, the way they interpreted this, all of these things that aren't circles had some level of accurate prediction one way or the other or both. Okay, but it turns out that, and so interpreting these results, they said, we feel confident that it's possible to take these niche models and project them into other climate surfaces and actually get a meaningful result out that shows us that we know what the species environment preferences are and that they haven't changed between 20,000 years ago and today. Um, but I interpreted the results differently looking at this paper. The thing that struck me was that only nine out of the 23 did they have a significant Pinecast of the Pleistocene. So on this axis, they took the rich data set of hundreds or even thousands of data points from the modern, 
built a niche model and projected it back onto the last glacial maximum and then saw whether or not those points matched with where the fossils were found. And in that approach, only nine out of the 23 were significantly better than just random projections, okay? Um, these other points that are not circles are points where um, this axis was significant and not this one. So they were able to take a niche model from the smaller data set in the Pleistocene and project it forward and get a significant result in the modern. And the reservation I have about that result is that when you're going from the small data set of, in their case, five to seven observations, that gives you a very poor constraint on your niche model and creates, as a consequence, a much more uh, liberal niche model. So I feel like it's not as um, it's not as good a test of the approach. Whereas this way, you have a huge data set in the modern. You're able to project a very well constrained, much more conservative niche model. And if that pushes back in the past and doesn't hit the five to seven fossil sites, it starts to make me worried that your very well constrained niche model from today can't hit a significant number of fossil sites. I also, um, as a paleontologist, was surprised at this paper because they went to the same fossil resources I used. They went to the Fawn Map database, which is a database of North American Pleistocene uh, mammal fossils. Um, and they picked these species and said they were the ones that had the best point representation, but they could only find five to seven sites for these species. I knew that I could go into Fawn Map and find many more sites than that for other species. So, um, so in the end, this paper has been, uh, and their conclusions in the paper are that, that there's niche conservatism in mammals, and it is a safe bet to take a niche model for a mammal species today and project it into future climate and use that as a way to anticipate where that species is going to move. But it never sat well with me. And, um, and then, um, this is actually a little bit chronologically out of order, but I wanted to talk about this paper. So this is by several of my colleagues, including Jack Williams, who work with the Neotoma Paleocology Database that I talked about in my previous talk. And they wanted to take the approach of being an Ice Age ecologist. What if I was an ecologist in the Ice Age and I wanted to know where species are going to live in the next interglacial? 20,000 years from now, what would it be like? And so they used fossil plant data, fossil pollen data, which if you're familiar with the fossil record is much richer. So instead of looking at tens to hundreds of points, they're looking at thousands of points for each, uh, for each species in the fossil record. And so they were able to take these observed distributions from about 17,000 years ago and then predict what the modern distribution of those species would look like. These are all fossil plants, okay? And then this is what we actually see when we look at the distributions of those plants. And what Williams et al. found was that there was very poor concordance between the projection from the Pleistocene to today and where the plants are actually found. In fact, it was very upsetting for them um, because it suggests that these plants are not using the environmental factors that's in the niche modeling software as, a, as the parameters that describe where the plants are going to actually live. Okay, so in this case, with fossil plant data, which is extremely rich compared to fossil mammal data, there does seem to be um, an important discordance between where the niche models would say the plants should be and where they actually are. Um, and then um, there are three other papers I'm going to talk about that looked at fossil mammals and took the same approach or a similar approach of looking at modern niche models and projecting them back to the last glacial maximum. Um, and we all found the same thing. Okay. And what's really interesting is that none of these papers has been cited as much as that Martina Meyer et al. paper has been cited. 
um, because they say what you don't want to hear. Um, and so the first one is by my colleagues, uh, Robert Ralnick and uh, Herman, um, where they were looking at alpine species and trying to understand the distribution of alpine species during the last glacial maximum. And they happened upon this accidentally because they weren't trying to test this hypothesis. They were going in with the idea that this would be an appropriate way to look at paleo distributions. But what they found was that most of the species that they looked at didn't have a good fit. So this is a map of the last glacial maximum. The dots represent where the fossils are found in the fossil record of the species. And then the gray and the dark gray are the two different levels of confidence in the niche model projected backwards from the modern distribution. And what you can see is that in this Tanius striatus and this Mycotus planetorum, the niche model completely misses, not completely for Mycotus, but definitely for Tanius. Tanius is living much closer to the ice edge than the niche model would project. Tanius is able to live in colder habitats than it does today in the last glacial maximum. There's a pretty good fit for Marmona Five of Interest, but it's not perfect. And it's missing like the, the high probability, the high probability part of the niche model is not hitting where the densest distribution of the fossils are. Okay, and then this is Picea. This is a plant uh, species like we saw before, and it's just reinforcing that mistake, the miss. Okay, and then um, with my colleague Jenny McGuire, and, uh, and I, we, we worked on this question with fossil mycotus species. So mycotus is the bowl in a, a mycotus in Europe. Okay. Okay. So it's a different genus, but in the same group. And so um, looking at these uh, five species of mycotus, uh, once again, this is the modern distribution with these dots up here. And this is the niche model projecting where it should live based on those modern distributions. And when we hindcast that back into the last glacial maximum, we saw only two of the species had a good match. Okay, so the black stars are where we have a fossil occurrence that's not hit by the niche model. The yellow star is where we have a fossil occurrence that is hit by the modern distribution, but not when we do the fossil distribution. <coughs> so in that case, the modern distribution without reference to the paleoclimate is a better match. And then the white stars are where we're correctly projecting the, niche, the distribution during the last glacial maximum. We did very well with Mycotus californicus, but um, Mycotus longicaudus has more that would fit with the modern distribution than with the fossil distribution, which suggests this is not moved and that this environmental niche model is, is hitting on all the wrong features. It doesn't really care about those features. Um, we saw a pretty good match for Microtus montanus, but it's very over-projected. It has a lot of area where we potentially could find the animal and don't. And then um, Mycotus oregoni is much more coastally distributed than we would expect. And similarly with Mycotus townsendii. And then the last one was one that uh, Jenny and I did with uh, John Orca, who was a PhD student at the time. And he's a professor at Gonzaga University now. And so we took niche models that had been created by another group, a paper by Waltari et al looking at last glacial maximum distributions, and we compared them to the fossil distribution of the organisms. And what we saw was consistently uh, southern overprediction. So you can see like in this shrew, it's predicting it to be much more southerly, and it's not. In the pine martin, you see it's predicting it to be more southerly, and it's not. In these two flying squirrels, we see a much more southern projection than it actually was living. So living much closer to the ice than the niche model would suggest. And then similarly with this myotes, um, it's projecting much more range to the south than it actually has in the fossil record. Okay. 
And so um, all these different results that we've got for mammals since 2010 show that we've got too far south for many of the projections or too coastal and only three out of these um, seem to have a good match. So there are some taxa that seem to have a good match for this LGM projection approach. And they tend to be taxa that have much more of an environmental connection in their natural history. So um, our mode of flight of interest is the yellow-bellied marmot. Um, and it is um, a strong hibernator. So it spends more than half of the year, three quarters of the year in hibernation. It lives in alpine ecosystems. And so it is strongly tied to the physical environment for its natural history. It's not surprising that it would be tied to the physical environment for its distribution. Okay. So uh, Jenny McGuire and I, working with Michelle Ku and other folks now, uh, got really curious if we could do something more like Martinez Meyer had done and look at a lot of different taxa. And we did. Um, and we were able to actually find much larger sample sizes in the FOMAP uh, database than Martinez Meyer had found. Um, so this is sort of an overview of the taxa that we looked at. We haven't published this result yet. We keep trying to refine it. And then as we refine it, people come out with new niche modeling techniques and we have to go back and completely revise the whole process. Since we're doing 50 niche models, it's becoming kind of cumbersome. Anyway, and what we found was that of those 50, eight of them matched well, okay? So like this is just an example of this Neotoma floridanus has a good match. It's fitting very well its fossil distribution with the hindcast of its um, niche from the model. 16 of them have what I would consider a partial match. Okay, so here we are with Marmota flat of interest again, which was the one that Veronica and Pearman had looked at. We're using a different niche modeling technique than they used. I believe they used GARP and we're using MaxNet at this point. And we're seeing still a pretty good fit, although it does project this big range over here that we know it's not living in. That's the sort of thing that you can deal with with planting and just say that's not part of what we should consider. Um, but there were 26, more than half, of the entries that had no match, where the fossils completely miss the um, distribution projection, okay? Like the raccoon here. Um, and of those 26, 24 of them, the niche model projected almost no geographic range present during the last glacial maximum. So this is the puma concolor, this is the, the puma or mountain lion. Um, this animal's interesting, a little bit of trivia. It has the most different common names of any mammal because its distribution goes from Alaska to the tip of Tierra del Fuego in South America. So it has 12 different English names and then like 20 names in Spanish. Okay, but this niche model projects that it had no suitable range, almost no suitable range during the last station maximum which can't be right, and so suggests that um, they're keying on factors that are not being found or not properly modeled by the niche model system. And so in the end, given these results, that we're seeing that some small proportion of mammals do fit well with the niche model, but most of them don't, it suggests there's two possibilities going on. One possibility is that these species have relatively stable fundamental niches that are much larger than we anticipated. And so when we look in the last glacial maximum, they're occupying part of that fundamental niche. Okay, so the climate that's available during the last glacial maximum pins them into part of this space. And then when we look at the modern time, the environment's different. We have what we call non-analog climates, where there are spaces today that have temperature and precipitation regimes that just weren't found at all 20,000 years ago, and vice versa. There are times 20,000 years ago that have no representation in modern climate space at all. And so in that case, it's moved to a different place. And so if we want to project into the future, we would want to understand better what this whole fundamental niche looks like. And we could probably do that by combining data from occurrences in the last spatial maximum with occurrences in the modern 
to at least map out more of what the fundamental niche of the species could be. The other possibility, and I think both of these are probably actually happening, different ones for different species, but the other possibility is that you actually have an evolutionary shift in the fundamental niche. So during the last glacial maximum, the fundamental niche is here, but there's enough time in the last 20,000 years for evolution to take place and metabolism and structures of the organism so that now they're in a different realized niche and there's not actually this connection here. So taking this approach wouldn't give you a good projection in the future and potentially um, uh, since our future climate scenarios are over such a short time period, this becomes less of an issue and you can feel okay with using this modern realized niche to think about what could happen over 100 years or 200 years as opposed to 20,000 years, okay? Um, so a lot of the research that I'm thinking about right now are ways to try to distinguish these two processes and see which one's more common or if there are any ways that we can assign species to one or the other. I don't have answers yet, but that's what I'm thinking about, okay? Um, I mentioned earlier that one of the things that we want to start looking at with conservation of non-analog ecosystems, of novel ecosystems, is thinking about the traits of the organisms that are represented and not about which species are represented as much. Okay, and so I wanted to end with a couple of recent studies by my colleague Robert Baralnik's lab. Um, <laughs> most of this work was led by Maggie Hintak, who's a postdoc now, I believe. And, um, and so these are two really cool studies that use the data that we have in our, in our Futres database. So this is the database of traits I talked about last week, a few weeks ago. Three weeks ago now? Yeah, I lost, I lost a lot of time in the hospital. Anyway. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Anyway, three weeks ago, so you can go back and rewatch that on the video if you want to. But uh, what what they did in this study was they wanted to look at specifically Paramyscus manipulatus. This is a North American deer mouse, a very cute animal. Um, they wanted to understand how its body size changed with climate change over the 20th century, but also human urbanization change. If you're not familiar with it. There's already been a huge amount of climate warming over the 20th century. And so using fossil or modern data from uh, biological collections, you can actually track species movements and shape changes through climate change just in the 20th century. And they were able to put together data uh, from the U.S. Census as well to look at urbanization. So how dense the people were in different areas. And as a consequence, they have a metric of population density of humans that they can apply to understanding the evolution of traits in this species. There's a picture. Okay. And so what we see is they have data on body mass and they have data on head body length. These are all from observations when mammalogists caught the animals in a little trap. They take their mass, write it down, measure it, and write it down and put the animal into the museum. And so we're looking at, uh, yeah, 20,000 specimens go into this analysis. And what we see is that with temperature increasing, we get a decrease in body mass, and we also get a decrease in body length. And that makes sense. We expect that based on Bergman's rule. When it's colder, having a bigger mass, being a bigger animal, helps you to conserve heat. And when it's warmer, being a smaller animal gives you a higher surface area to volume and you can cool yourself faster. So that's expected based on physics. When we look at precipitation, we see the same pattern. And that's in part because precipitation and temperature are correlated, at least in North America. But what's really interesting is that as population density increased, the length of the animals decreased, okay? And there's not a significant relationship with their mass. And so what we're seeing is that when there are more people in an ecosystem, these, these mice get shorter, but they don't get less massive. So they become fatter, okay? And so what's happening, we think, is that they have to hide out from humans to exist commensally in that space, but there's a lot of resources available in terms of free calories from human waste 
that they're using to maintain their biomasses. That's kind of cool that we can see that from the data over the 20th century. Um, and then they followed up with a bigger study that looked at 100 different species of mammals in the same kind of context, okay? And so what they found there was, amongst other things, I'm just going to highlight this one result. Um, yeah, 140,000 records, 100 different species. When you look at body mass and head body length against human population density, and you break it out by whether the animals are awake in the day or at night or all the time, you just start. You know, animals that don't pick a time but are active when they need to be. You can see that diurnal animals have a slight negative relationship with population density and body mass. When there are more people in the ecosystem, animals that are awake during the day are smaller because they have to hide. Animals that are nocturnal, on the other hand, are slightly larger when there's more human presence in their mass. And there's not really a relationship for their length. So nocturnal animals, again, are more massive while maintaining the same body length. Um, and then we see the animals that are awake during the day and at night actually both have a positive relationship. So more people means that they are bigger, but they also are more massive. And we think that this mass part is probably related to um, probably related to food resources being available, okay? These are really subtle. When you look at this, this is what's left over after you extract the temperature relationship. Um, and there's also even a heat island relationship. So being in urban areas where it stays hotter or longer has more of an effect on body mass than this population in some part does. Um, but we have the sort of records that we can start to piece this apart now, and I think that's really cool. So in the end, fossil data are important for improving niche models of extant taxa. We're not sure exactly how the best use them yet, but I think that it's, there's enough results now that we can be confident that we should be looking at both modern distributions and fossil distributions if we're trying to make the most optimal the niche models. Um, like I said, we need to explore realized niches versus shifts in niches. Um, and don't be afraid to look for fossil data if you have a modern biological problem. There are so many data available online now that you can probably find some to help inform your analysis. Um, that's because of the advances in informatics. And I think future work is going to actually have to look at both traits and biodiversity. And at this point, we've had several centuries of modern scientific collecting of both modern biology and fossil organisms. So we have a good sample size for starting to deal with a lot of these problems. And that's what I had to say. Thank you very much.